and welcome back. As we mentioned before the commercial break, that we are joined on set this morning, Jamie, by mm -hmm. Irvin Perez, and he is an economist here to talk to us this morning about the IMF prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Mr. Perez. Good morning. Um, and good morning, Belize. We know that uh, the IMF paid a, a recent visit based yeah. on their Article 4. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, at the end of the visit, usually the team kind of provides a very preliminary summary mm -hmm. of their findings and their possible recommendation. Mm -hmm. But this is not the, the final IMF report, which usually comes out about four months subsequent to the visit and is signed off by the executive board mm -hmm. of the IMF. So this is just what you would call preliminary finding of from their visit. But just before we jump into that, for those who are unaware, tell us why the IMF decided to come in to, and do an evaluation of the, the landscape, the economic landscape, and to offer their, their advice and prescription. Well, and I'm not going to do far back into history, <laughs> but subsequent to 1945, after World War II, um, the, the victory, um, the side that were in victory, the country said, you know what, we need a better financial, global financial system, and we need to create certain agencies to help countries. IMF was one of the first, um, IMF and the World Bank was set up around that time to help. The IMF was focused on what you call balance of payment issues, which is mm -hmm. countries trade with each other. You know, we trade goods and, ser goods and services, mm -hmm. and we also move capital. We move money between countries. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, those trade arrangements can lead to imbalances, meaning yeah. you owe me more than I owe you, and then we ha you have a problem with paying. So the IMF came aboard. Mm -hmm. um, over time, however, um, countries, as they became independent, joined the IMF, which Belize is a part of, and part of the... Uh, membership requirement is a regular surveillance. So all countries from the United States mm -hmm. to the, the big German countries go through what you call an IMF surveillance, which is an IMF team comes in, sits with your major um, decision makers, both from an economic, a business perspective, the mark, the, the sectors, kind of get a broad perspective, and then they make recommendations. So it's to help, right? It's uh, yeah. kind of a providing a help to its members mm -hmm. in terms of is your policy adequate based on our global trading arrangements or are there things that you can do to improve it? Mm -hmm. IMF also has been able to come in and provide loan support for countries where there is a balance of, of, uh, balance of payment issues and usually those that in the, in the past would come with what you'd call some conditionalities, right? right? And then they would monitor and do surveillance to monitor that the countries that have taken on a loan it's like if you go and borrow at the bank, the bank might say, well, here are some conditions to your borrowing. Right. And they just ensure that you're doing that. Belize is not at this current time in any IMF arrangement. So it's just a normal annual surveillance. Definitely. It hasn't been either uh, as far as, as, far as um, previous conversations with the prime minister goes. Insofar as 2008 when the United Democratic Party, and it's not to make it a uh, political thing is just the fact that government since um, 2008 hasn't really been following any of the recommendations and prescriptions being made by the IMF. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say they haven't been following mm -hmm. any, um, but from some time previous to mm -hmm. this current administration, uh, a lot of governments um, regionally has decided that we, would, we will take the advice with some grain of salt. Mm -hmm. We're always going to look at homegrown um, solutions mm -hmm. uh, because we have to deal with our own uh, constituency mm -hmm. and therefore we may be a little bit more familiar with how policies will actually play out yeah. but mm -hmm. there are some basic fundamental economic principles yeah. um, whether it's coming from the IMF or from your local economist that mm -hmm. is relevant and that you need to put forward so we wanted to take a look at some of the the broad points mm -hmm. that the IMF um, hinted on or looked at and also some of the areas of concern not just for them but primarily for Belizeans being that we're going to be the ones here eating eating the pie I would say definitely and it, and it speaks to the to the level of transparency mm -hmm. and accountability and other good governance practices that are necessary within any country that, that prescribe to global institutions and, mm -hmm. and global standards and principles yeah. tell us a little bit about the the components of what a, a prescription and an evaluation would look like well, before, if I could take a look at, uh, I think it's slide number three. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. It's just to give our audience a little um, background on yeah. some, there'll be some, I know we can't see everything. Yeah. But when you're reading the IMF um, 
concluding remarks, you'll hear about something called current account and our current account deficit. Mm -hmm. And um, countries like Belize, poor countries tend to run large current account for a very long period of time. Why? Yeah. Because we don't generate enough income. Right. And so for our audience, I wanted us to kind of have a sense of how this fits into our own lives mm -hmm. and do a, what they call a very basic comparison with household income because we all deal with our own households. Yeah. So in a household, you have a cash inflow, right? Mm -hmm. And that's generated basically from, from the family income. Either both spouses are working or one is working and bringing the money into the home. Mm -hmm. A country is similar. A country generates a cash inflow by selling, by exporting to the rest of the world. Both goods and services. So we know tourism is a big service sector for the country and that service industry generates an income for the country. Then there is what you call secondary cash inflows into a home. And you know, we may be a member of a credit union, we have a little bit of savings account in the bank, etc. And from the saving account, we get some interest income from the credit union at the end of the year. If they've performed well, we get a dividend payment. And so that's a secondary source of income. We may also get some families um, meeting certain socioeconomic condition may get a subsidy. So, you know, the government recently had provided cash transfers and also had provided a subsidy for high school. So you call it a subsidy being a transfer from the state to a household, and that's also part of your income. Yeah. And then on the other hand, there is expenditures. So a household has to spend. So, you know, a mortgage or rent, utilities, transportation costs are all outflows of a home. And so that means that we have to take money and use it to get those goods and services. Mm -hmm. Similar with a country, you have investment income. Countries may have um, savings uh, accounts abroad, may have investment abroad. For example, our central bank invests its foreign reserves abroad in for, for it might be US dollar, um, treasury bills, etc. Mm -hmm. And that generates an income that comes back into the country. Mm -hmm. In addition, we have friendly neighbors like Taiwan who may provide us with grant support. Mm -hmm. And so those are also sources of income. And they tend to be small relative to income coming from exports. Yeah. And like a household, countries consume. So we wear um, iPhone, we have the Samsung, we have the new car, none of which we build. Most of the clothes we wear are mm -hmm. imported. Yeah. And we have to pay for those goods. Um, and services and now with, with online we also have um, households that may have Netflix and so forth mm -hmm. and so you're paying for these services and that's sending money abroad right the net result in the household of the income that you come in and the expenditure results in a position what you call a household position either you'll have a surplus so your house is your household income is more than you're expending yeah. or you have a deficit similar with a country right if we import um, most of the goods and services that we consume and we export and generate an income, but if our imports are significantly larger than our exports, mm -hmm. then at the end of the day, at the end of the year, we're going to generate a deficit and you will hear current account deficit. Mm -hmm. Now, both, and we did a quick, if I go to the next slide, um, just a little quick comparison with numbers because sometimes it's easier for somebody to see. So that's just a general example. The household income is 100, investment income 2,000. So the total cash coming into the house, 102,000. But this household spends more than it earns, 132,000. So every year, this is just an annual idea, every yeah. year the house has to find $30,000 to meet its consumption. Mm -hmm. And the country here, quite similar somewhat to where Belize is, mm -hmm. yeah. that's a billion dollars economy export and we're investment income and other income 50 about well 50 million mm -hmm. so our exports would generate about 1 billion 50 but our consumption is a bit higher from mm -hmm. imports so we run a current account deficit now 500 yeah. million dollars a year mm -hmm. now remember you're consuming those goods so some you have to pay for it mm -hmm. so just like a house the country then borrows um, borrows and it has to borrow in foreign exchange because mm -hmm. it has to borrow in a currency that is globally accepted. Yeah. So that current account deficit is one of the things that were mentioned in the IMF report. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll just talk to you guys about some broad points. So this was mm -hmm. some of the issues that um, we are aware of it domestically yeah. as well. Um, the economy looks positive but weak, meaning that we're showing recovery within the productive sector, mm -hmm. um, you know, commodities. Um, you can see in the first quarter report from SIB, there's growth, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of weaknesses, I meaning there's still some issues, and we'll go into the detail. Mm -hmm. Public debt remains high. Yes, we did some restructuring of the super bond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in a better position, but the debt level to GDP, which is usually mm -hmm. a measure of sustainability, is still extremely high. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the current account deficit. 
It's large, mm -hmm. and that's a structural issue with our country. I mean, structural mean it's not something that's yesterday or five mm -hmm. years from now mm -hmm. or 10 years. Every single year from I've looked back at data, the country has run a current account deficit. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads to um, the whole issue of productivity. As you might recall, we were having some problems with corresponding banks, yeah, right? We were. And that corresponding bank issue has been generally resolved, but still remains yeah. um, in the background, meaning that a lot of a lot of that has to be done to ensure that we're moving in the right direction in, in that regard isn't we're not there yet mm -hmm. um, the banking sector which is our mm -hmm. major financial institutions in our market mm -hmm. um, their capital position has become better uh, but there is one bank that generates some issues with risk because of the level of capitalization yeah. mm -hmm. now there's some broad positives if we look at the other slide so so what are the positives from the, from the meeting? Well, the IMF said, well, your economy is going to grow. That's the expectation domestically and abroad based on a number of factors. You've obtained some savings and time mm -hmm. with the debt restructuring that, you, that we accomplished. The financial sector reforms, there has been reforms in the financial sector through Pension Act, through banking sector reforms um, that has been showing good, good sign, mm -hmm. positive. So our non-performing loads, you can see that if you watch the, the newspapers, mm -hmm. there's a lot of properties going onto the market for auction. Yeah. So the banks have been improving their balance sheet by liquidating non-performing loans, selling the collateral and yeah. writing off. So the non-performing loans have gone down and that's good relative to overall loans. And generally the bank's capital are high. So capital, what is capital? You know, capital is the, your, your skin in the game. So the owners of the bank has put a lot more of their own money mm -hmm. into their banks and that creates more buffers against shocks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, inflation is contained. So yes, price levels are up, but it's not jumping off the roof. Um, because we have a fixed exchange rate, our inflation is basically imported and pegged to our trading partners. Mm -hmm. And globally, inflation has been mild to deflationary, meaning that there's a lot less price pressures. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to import the inflation of our country, major trading partners, example being United States, and they have a problem with inflation, meaning inflation is low, and they're still trying to fight a little bit of a deflationary kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. And finally, like we have mentioned, the CBR, which are the corresponding banking issues, have mm -hmm. kind of eased a bit. Mm -hmm. So those are the the broad positives from the meeting. Let's go back a bit. You mentioned the idea of the banks being able to liquidate on uh, faulty loans. Yeah. I was having a conversation over the course of the weekend uh, in respect of the number of foreclosures that we continue to see. Yeah. If you pick up a newspaper, half of what has been published in a newspaper are actually properties that are up for sale yeah. because the people who are indebted to the various banking institutions are no longer able to uh, service those loans. They go into default and then the bank has to sell. Yeah. What does that say about our economy though? And that's exactly right. Remember the economy looks positive and mm -hmm. it's growing, but the, growing, the growth is low mm -hmm. and there's a lot of weakness. Mm -hmm. And so it still demonstrates that there is significant weakness in the economy. Mm -hmm. However, the banks are doing what they need to do. So mm -hmm. banks have to clean up their balance sheet, meaning that if you have a lot of bad debt, mm -hmm. a lot of non-performing loans, a non-performing mm -hmm. loan for a bank is just an asset that isn't generating any income. Mm -hmm. And what that does for the bank, if the bank doesn't um, deal with it, it kind of inflates your, their balance sheet, makes mm -hmm. it look better, and also um, kind of inflates income level, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the banks are in a position, they know that for us to grow, to be healthy, we need to get rid of those um, non-performing loans. So they've been doing that and doing the right thing, of course, urged on by the regulator, the central mm -hmm. bank. And so the banks are, um, non-performing loans are falling and their capital adequacy, so they've been injecting more of their capital into the banking system, is up. The challenge we're having uh, in terms of financial is that the banks are still very, um, conservative mm -hmm. in terms of looking at going forward and lending yeah. when you know when you've been burnt and you're you're before mm -hmm. you're a little bit more cautious right and that's globally mm -hmm. and it's the same with our banks where they're saying well we want to make sure we're properly collateralized before we do additional lending and so um, one of the things that the IMF pointed out which I didn't put here was that although there is so much liquidity 
in the banking system, meaning the last uh, number I looked at was somewhere about $250 million in excess cash. And that's mm -hmm. been going down because of government borrowing. Government has been borrowing in the market, taking out some of the liquidity. But even with all that excess liquidity, loan growth last year was actually negative. Mm -hmm. So there was a contraction in total loans outstanding by about 3%. So the banks are not being very aggressive at lending. And when that doesn't happen, uh, your economy tends to kind of like just, you know, move along very slowly. Mm -hmm. And that's a concern. Do you think that speaks to the lack of, well, especially we know that the economy is highly based a lot um, on social factors, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that the people who live within the country. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that speaks to the, the level of financial literacy that exists within homes? And also, the, the, like you said, the lack of um, innovation within the banking system itself? You hit the nail on the head. There's a couple of things there. One is obviously financial literacy in home, but also financial literacy in companies. Like yeah. how do you present a better picture to a banker to make mm -hmm. him or her more comfortable mm -hmm. with um, going forward and being a partner in a project? But there's also, um, as you had mentioned, innovation. The banks need to be a bit more innovative in terms of how can we move this market forward. Mm -hmm. And the IMF also had discussed that, and we domestically have talked about the building up of a capital market, you know, mm -hmm. the allowing more longer term capital acquisition, which is needed. Yeah. And that also requires banks to be involved because they're the, bigger pl they're the biggest players in the financial markets. Mm -hmm. The challenge we have sometimes with innovation with our banks is that most of the ownership is abroad. And so when you have uh, banks that are owned primarily by foreigners outside, they're not as innovative yeah. because mm -hmm. they're not in the, they're not they're, they're not, not tied there. to the same issues, yeah. right? Yeah. So they are going to be more cautious. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, but some other eras, and the IMF uh, discussed this, and I have some time before we talked about information, right? So right. when you're lending, having proper information is is helpful. And so there has been some time ago the, the discussion and even a project about building what you call a credit bureau system. Mm -hmm. So a credit bureau system is supposed to reduce informational or, or lack of information. Mm -hmm. So I can get more information about you and your credit history and the quality of your ability to repay, um, even though I don't know you, I haven't done business with mm -hmm. you. So there is a recommendation again to revisit looking at a credit bureau mm -hmm. to help with some of that. So there is a, a lot of things that we need to do in terms of trying to move um, on, on a terms of a financial side, move that the financial system, improve it so that we can get going with um, investments. Now, in looking at the IMF and its prescriptions from a broader perspective, I know that as the financial arm of the United Nations, so to speak, yeah. the IMF has come under considerable criticism from some of the member nations because whatever their prescriptions are, aren't particularly tailored to the individual countries. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like a broad-based approach to yeah. trying to solve a problem as opposed to looking at your specific needs and the, the direct state of your economy for them to be able to prescribe something that actually works. Yeah. Can you speak to that a, a bit? Of yeah, that's, that's been one of the challenges for the IMF. As you know, there are different school of economics. Mm -hmm. yeah. I come from a neoliberal school myself, which is more aligned with their, their perspective, the IMF mm -hmm. uh, economists and how they view economies should be run. But there are many schools of thought. One of the challenges um, countries have had is that there is a particular school of thought that has been pushed forward a lot by the IMF that has not really resulted in the kind of economic growth and development mm -hmm. that you see. And so there has been a um, significant pushback in regards to some of those recommendations. Now, there are some fundamental economic principles which all economic schools kind of buy into. Mm -hmm. um, efficiency is better than inefficiency. Mm -hmm. um, you may get better results from private actors uh, operating certain things mm -hmm. than, than governments, yeah. etc. So some recommendations are, are valid. And you have to have your own, as you said, you, you kind of want to sift the recommendations mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, this may work and this may not work and we're going to try some and we're going to not try others. And that's, that's important to, to have your own mind. Mm -hmm. But you should not also, therefore, go against what we call fundamental economic principles. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's uh, striking a balance. The other issue often is that uh, countries are run by politicians yeah. and there is a political directorate, a community. Mm -hmm. So in the short term, 
prescriptions might be um, very painful, meaning that a structural adjustment. Let's say, for example, structurally our country imports, and this besides part, this is not a partisan thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So structurally, we import so much more than our exports. Mm -hmm. To change that dynamic would require some structural changes. In the short term, those structural changes may be very painful as a country, but in the long run, there is an upside to it. But very few uh, politicians are prepared to do those short-term painful things because the election cycles are every five years. And so I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. if, if you don't mind sticking a pin there no momentarily. Problem. I think from what I've been made to understand, there has been this recommendation that the general sales tax goes from 12.5% to 15%. Yeah which is a, an, a, a difference of 2.5%. Yeah. But if we're already buckling under the weight of 12.5, yeah. then some people are of the opinion that 15 is going to kill us. Yeah. So, I have the same, opinion. <laughs> I want the same opinion too. So, so then perhaps there is not the political will to proceed with increasing the GST simply because of what could be perceived as the fallout come election day. Well, there's some economic principles why you wouldn't want to also raise your taxes. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have to take everything with a grain of salt and also look from it from an economic perspective. Mm -hmm. When you have a, a slow economy, taxes are called barriers. Taxes are like headwinds, mm -hmm. right? So raising taxes create headwinds, which can drive your economy back into a recession. So you have to be very careful about increasing taxes in mm -hmm. general. Um, and so this is one prescription which usually goes against fundamental economic principles, which is in a slow economy, in a economy just coming out of recession, you want to reduce taxes. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you want to remove as much barriers to the economy from going forward. So mm -hmm. I think the government which came out and said, you know, we're not, this is off the table. That's right. Then on mm -hmm. another point in terms of um, fairness, and I'm, you know, people say like, I'm justice or fairness, the consumption tax is a tax that that hits um, low-income um, individuals much harder than high-income mm -hmm. individuals. It's what you call a broad-based consumption tax. It's not a tax that's designed based on income levels. Mm -hmm. So raising GST is going to hurt um, low-income, poor families a lot more than it would hurt me and you or a middle-income family. So that's, that's another thing to look at. So I don't think um, this is something that has any traction in both, from both parties and I don't think it makes economic sense. Mm -hmm. The other thing though why the IMF is prescribing it is that generally in the region GST is 15%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Barbados and Jamaica and so forth, mm -hmm. I mean they're foolish to have went ahead and do it, you know, but um, you know, all countries have their own perspectives. Yeah. And there are other ways from our perspective and my perspective, there's other ways that you want to stimulate the economy yes. uh, as opposed to. This is a measure primarily to, to boost government revenue mm -hmm. simply because um, of the level of debt. And yeah. what they're looking at is you need to raise revenue, cut costs, so that you can start paying down your debt. Um, and if we look at, um, if we go to the next slide, um, the economic outlook. Um, oh, here we are on this slide already. So some of the other issues that are definitely, um, like for example, and I'll, let me just clarify right here, I speak mm -hmm. for myself and not for my firm. Yeah. So my opinions here are myself, or Irving mm -hmm. Paris, not the firm, <laughs> so that the firm <laughs> shareholders and the directors know. Yeah. Um, the IMF recommends a cap on the on growth in public servants. Now that's, that's absolutely some. We mm -hmm. need to start getting more productivity yeah. out of the public service, mm -hmm. which means that we need to Maybe you would, you would not have, there's no discussion on retrenchment, but mm -hmm. what you'd want to see is more productivity out of what you have. So mm -hmm. training, development of, of, of technology to help move and have a more efficient public service as opposed to growing by adding more mm -hmm. um, labor. So that's clearly a sum. And they want also to put a cap on the wage bill. So meaning mm -hmm. that you want to have very slow increases in your wage bill for the public service. It's been something that has been high and it's a significant, significant part of our government expenditure. So those are some fundamental economic principles. You need more productivity out of your public service because you need your public service, but you need to get mm -hmm. more of it and you need to contain the wage bill. The second issue that I know will, will create, raise, raise some firestorm is yeah. public servants have been comfortable with what you call non-contributory pension. So you mm -hmm. work in a public service yeah. and when you retire there's a defined benefit. Mm -hmm. Basically you get paid till you die. Yeah. Right? 
it's not sustainable for the country. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's important to understand. It's not a sustainable structure. Mm -hmm. And so the IMF and local economists, if they're smart, should be recommending mm -hmm. that we need to transition to a contributory pension system, which is what is in the private sector. Yeah. Meaning that if a private company has a pension, or the, and now the Pension Act that is now in place, all these private pensions has to be registered. Mm -hmm. You contribute and your employer contributes to put into a pool. And then that pool, whether it becomes a defined benefit, so the, the yeah. company says you're going to have some defined benefits, or we're going to invest this pool together, and based on the performance of the investment mm -hmm. over your life here, Mm -hmm. you're going to get a lump sum or annuity or whatever. Yeah. That's where the public pension plan has to go for mm -hmm. long-term sustainability. Now, mm -hmm. I know public servants and public servant unions are going to take a tough stand on going to that direction, mm -hmm. but for the, for the broader good of the country, that's what has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of governance, you had mentioned some governance issues. Um, there needs to be an improvement in the procurement process from government, meaning how they buy goods and services, mm -hmm. um, enhanced monitoring of government-supported entities. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that the IMF has recommended, and timely audits. These are all reasonable um, recommendations, recommendations that we all, as a, as a country, support. Like, the average common sense man would say, yeah, we want government to, to show us their books and yeah. do it in a reasonable time because they're spending our money. So mm -hmm. those are reasonable um, recommendations that we should not have anybody recommending them for us for yeah. us to implement. Yeah, and for right? the audits to be timely, I don't think we've had a, a proper audit of most government bodies in a while. That's right. And I think that's very embarrassing for our nation. And I th how to the to the, to the, the previous point on mm -hmm. the public pension scheme, I'd, I'd like to to just explore that just a little bit okay. because when we look at the Caribbean, like you mentioned, for instance, you look at. Uh, Jamaica, how they have their public sector uh, pension reform program, okay. and how it speaks to that that contributory sense of t sense of pension. How do you convince public sector workers, public servants, sorry, <laughs> to buy into that? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> uh, I think that clearly, from I'm not a public servant, but clearly from their perspective, it's always good to have a conversation with me if you start by doing the right thing yourself. Mm -hmm. So it starts with our leadership saying, we're going to make some sacrifices ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you're asking me to sacrifice, but you're not sacrificing, well, it'll be a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the challenge. So I think there has to be sacrifice from the top to be able to have this conversation, meaning that we're prepared to cut and to do some reductions on our consumption at the leadership level. And then we're saying, you know what, you need to, you need to, you need to share the pain. So, um, and everybody has to jump in there. So. It has to go that in that direction. I think if you don't have that, you're unlikely to have traction. The other thing is, and I'll say it before when, we, when we're at the end, is that um, you have to have a bipartisan buy-in. It can't be a political right. yeah. about, about. If, you know, If you're starting to have this conversation and then the opposition is saying, ah, la, 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 you want to take away stuff from the mm -hmm. public servants, you're not going to have support. This is something that has to be supported by all sides, yeah. by both the opposition, the government, and any third party saying, you know what, the country needs to move in a certain direction mm -hmm. for sustainability. But again, the leadership has to show and demonstrate that they're willing to make sacrifices at the top so that the, the rank and file, me and you, the, the small man, can say, well, you know, if you're willing for this some cuts, mm -hmm. I am prepared to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying now that they're going to just buy into it, but yeah. we're prepared to have it on the table. Mm -hmm. But this yeah. is the challenge is that as far as that sense of maturity goes, because that requires that, that, that overall mature approach, yeah. I don't know that we're there yet as no, a we're country. Not. <laughs> we're so not it, it comes off as sort of uh, wishful thinking in a sense yeah. that we would have all of these political organizations come together and say, you know what, for the sake of the advancement and the, the, the progress of the nation then that we will all buy into this one particular idea. I don't know that we're there yet in terms of that sense of maturity yeah. that brings us all to that table. No, we're not. And unfortunately, um, that's the current condition. Mm -hmm. And that has to come from us now. <laughs> I think to force our leadership on both sides to say, you know what, there are certain economic realities that mm -hmm. we need to address as a country. We're only 250,000, 260,000 yeah. people. And if we can't get on this together, then we're all going to sink, right? And so often, sometimes it's crisis, it's, it's a situation that um, 
you are in such a bind that it forces that maturity to develop. Hopefully we can do it without that taking place. But one of the challenges we have here um, is that if you don't have that consensus, while we are aware of what we need to do, mm -hmm. we are unable to get it done. There's no political will, as you had said. Why? Yeah. Because if I advance it as an administration, the opposition is going to use it against me mm -hmm. to win the next election. Mm -hmm. And if and the opposition, it's so easy to say you're taking this, you're taking that, right? So it's it's very challenging for us and for a lot of small countries to have that kind of uh, maturity to move forward. Um, even large countries are mm -hmm. um, developed economies are sometimes um, the polarity in their democracy mm. prevents them from solving problems. They look at the United States and their healthcare reform. You mm -hmm. know, the need there's a need for them to adjust their healthcare system because it's bankrupting their country, but they're unable to get together to do it. On our own end, we're a much smaller country, 250 mm. something thousand people. We all know each other. We we're must still find a way. With the same problems. Though. Yeah, we face with the same problems, <laughs> but we, you know, we, like you said, we must find a way yeah. of of being able to advance these issues because it leads to a whole lot of other issues that you guys have mentioned I think previous show mm -hmm. the level of crime the level of violence the instability in certain communities is a result of poor economics mm -hmm. speaking of economic realities I know that this might be a, a, a kind of devil's advocate kind of solution but how realistic is the option of speeding up the economy you know that the, the school of thought where you have an increase of government expenditure in order to drive the economy well, right now, our government is strapped, right? So one of the things in terms of why the medium-term projections for economic growth is slow is that mm -hmm. public spending has to be contained. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this cannot come from the public sector. Mm -hmm. Where the investment has to come from is the private sector in terms of mm -hmm. making that investment. And some of the things that have been pointed out is clearly our primary sectors have been having challenges. So the agricultural sector, in the, in the fisheries, in the uh, citrus, in the bananas, and if, of, of, so forth, agro-processing, etc. So we have to make tremendous amount of investments from a private uh, perspective to move that economy forward. You're right, uh, economic growth rate of about 2.5% for a country like ours is anemic and will not result in any significant change. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to see our poverty rate declining significantly. Yeah. You're right, we must have to have, we have to have significant growth, eight, nine percent. And at this point, that growth has to come and be funded primarily from private sector investment. I don't see <coughs> if that is something that is going to happen in the short term, but that's something we have to encourage. Is that something mm -hmm. that's included in the, in the <coughs> prescription from the IMS? Cause IMF? Because I know that PPPs across the, con the, the globe yeah. are very successful in terms of speeding up the economy because you have the expertise and the, the, the capital from the private sector. And then you have the, 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 the partnership that yes. you need with government because I think that's something we, we forget within yeah. our country that it's not the responsibility of just government. We are, we are stakeholders as well. The private sector are, are stakeholders as well. Is that included in I the know the last, in the last IMF surveillance, there was some consideration for looking at the PPPs, the public-private partnerships mm -hmm. in terms of development. Especially government might be strapped for cash, but government yeah. might be able to put forward legislation, government might be able to provide yeah. uh, the land assets, technical, um, administration. technical administration to support. And then usually some of these PPPs results in a transfer of the assets over the long yeah. run back to the public mm -hmm. and can take the investment there. Our country hasn't set up, a, I think, a credible at this point institution. Okay. I know in other countries they've created like PPP yeah. agencies yeah. to mm -hmm. actually identify mm -hmm. specific projects or specific uh, what you call high value areas of investment mm -hmm. that they want to see happen that might spur mm -hmm. the economy. So we need to go there. I know government has moved forward and advanced economic development council yeah. and now legislated it. And I think that would be one of the first uh, bodies because it also, it has a private public kind of structure yeah. mm -hmm. to start looking at specific projects um, to move the economy forward. And a lot of the projects are are infrastructural, as you right. say, the need to put certain things in place to get the economy going. Some might be investments in new areas where the public and the private can make the investment together. The private sector having a little bit more confidence because the government is on a board. So, yeah, excellent points. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any other areas in terms of your presentation that, that needs to be covered? Well, we have discussed it in, in some broad sense, but mm -hmm. if we look at there's a, I think it's a slide number nine financial reforms, which is what you have up there, mm -hmm. um, tied to 
the PPP is tied to making the changes economically. We also have to reform our financial system yeah. to get the best bang for our money. Mm -hmm. And one of the recommendations was in terms of how GOB financing takes place. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, and it has been, the government has been moving away from it, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. you know, strong form recommendation from the private sector. Um, in terms of not financing through the overdraft facility at the central bank. So you know the central bank used to create this overdraft. We call it high-powered financing. Monies from that government just creates money in the economy and can lead to a lot of liquidity issues, right? Yeah. So the recommendation is let's just phase that out altogether and government then has to borrow in the market like everybody else, mm -hmm. right? And the government has been doing that to so replace the OD facility with active government borrowing in the securities market. Government has been doing that recently, and our expectation is that's something that's going to take place. And that helps. What it does, it, when government borrows in the market mm -hmm. in, an, in an open and transparent process, yeah. it allows us to price discovery, to understand what is the cost for debt in the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. Allows the private sector to also borrow uh, reasonably well. Yeah. So that's something to look at. And then um, financial market reform includes... Uh, Provisioning in the banks, that one I am not certain we would agree with. The 100% provisioning for banks if they're secure or unsecured loans. What that does, when the banks have to provision, it, it reduces their, their net income. Mm -hmm. And a banker will say then it increases the, um, the cost of providing credit, which again slows the economy. So you have to strike a balance yeah. there. And um, they wanted to do some kind of, the IMF was recommending to do a, what you call an asset quality test on banks mm -hmm. to see if they're properly capitalized. Okay. General. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Paris. This has You're been welcome. quite an informative session. But I think but, but before we wrap up, and I, I hate to sound like a little fairy or a little um, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> Disney magic character, but are they, regarding the general outlook, what are some of the, the, the light, what's the light at the end of the tunnel that we can look forward to regarding our economy? Well, Belize is blessed. I mean, I'm a person that has always been very bullish on the country because of mm -hmm. the broad resource base that we have. So in terms of resource, vis-a-vis um, -vis other regional mm -hmm. um, countries, especially within CARICOM, yeah. I mean, we've been hearing this over and over, Belize yeah. can be the food basket of the Caribbean. We have yeah. a very small pop population mm -hmm. with a lot of arable land. Mm -hmm. So we need to get going in terms of making investments. Okay. Um, the, the end of the tunnel is we need to export our way out mm -hmm. of our condition. So we need to work extremely hard mm -hmm. to get where we need to go. But if we can, within the next 10, 15 years, transition from a, a economy that runs a general current account deficit to a current account surplus, we'll be making, we'll be making this, we'll be moving in the right direction, I'll say. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Perry. Thanks for being here. We are going to take a quick break, and when, it's com when we come back, it's to talk to the Minister of Agriculture about their about the agricultural sector and, and other initiatives coming up from the ministry. So stay tuned.